Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 421, and our lesson title today is Dominion Theology. Scripture indicates two great courses that the saints are to qualify for. Saints of the Old Covenant, Saints of the New Covenant. <clears throat> From the time of Jesus' ministry to his last coming is a time for qualifying for rulership positions in the kingdom of the heavens. Rulership positions in the kingdom of the heavens. Turn to Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the original Greek, it's the kingdom of the heavens. So what he's saying here is the time is commencing at that point to enter in to qualify for rulership in the kingdom. <clears throat> now we see during this period, which is from the time Jesus' ministry starts, until the time of the second coming positions are going to be given for rulership in the kingdom turn to Luke 22 verse 29 <clears throat> And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my father hath appointed unto me. So everybody in the Prototokos classification becomes a ruler over a kingdom. And of course there will be lesser positions of rulership in the kingdom. Turn to Luke 19. Verse 15 to 19. <clears throat> and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded those servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. Second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said, Likewise unto him, Be thou also over five cities. So there will be position, lesser positions of rulership in the kingdom of the heavens. But the, uh, the <clears throat> teacher position, the prototokos position, is going to be that of the sovereign, the, the ruler over a nation, over a kingdom. Now, <clears throat> those that rule, the, of those that have this preeminent position, there are going to be two 
classifications, two types of rulership according to the scripture. Those who rule and those who instruct. Both callings are from eternity. Turn to Revelation, the second chapter, verse 26 to 27. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, in other words, that qualifies, to him will I give power over the nations. The word power is authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So this is sovereign, unmovable. <coughs> Uh, rulership now the other type of rulership we find starting in Matthew 24 verse 45 a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler, ruler, ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. This is the second type of rulership. This is instruction, teaching. This is <coughs> rulership by <coughs> what would be considered scholastic imputation over the kingdom. So why do you have these two types of rulerships? Because of the individuals that are being ruled. The unceasing dictatorial rulership is imposed on those who have a rebellious, intractable implacable <coughs> characteristic that that's the only way they can come into a comprehension of the things of God is it has to be demanded of them imposed upon them the other type of rulership is for the mature we're going to find these two intelligences in God's creation <coughs> on this planet and in the vast regions of the heavens. Why? Because of what Lucifer did in corrupting the creation. He instituted his own methodology of deception which was purposeful in leading <coughs> God's intelligences away from God and the ways of God. They in order to bring them back into subjectivity to God have to be dealt with from a position of <clears throat> unflinching authority. Either you bend or you break. <clears throat> the other part of God's creation are those that are mature and open to receive instruction <clears throat> and growth and don't necessitate an iron fist they necessitate teaching, Instru instruction. Yeah. So we so have these two types. Yes. We might be. <coughs> cool. Yes. So, Brother Jones, as you're speaking, I'm seeing where there needs to be a regulation. There needs to be laws. So what would you say to that? Well, well, that's the way they'll be instructed. Some would be instructed under law, and some will be brought into it, you need no law. Uh, they are open to the law of love. You find that even here. You have law and you have grace. One seems to be a little bit more physical than the other. One seems to be a little bit more spiritual. The grace seems spiritual, the law seems physical. Well, it is. 
basically because those that are under law are more in a position of physical uh, rudimentary that's where they that's where they basically dwell in a low grade level of existence those that are under grace are higher level uh, they flow in harmony they don't need to be uh, <clears throat> brought into a position of demanding they will voluntarily yield to instruction because they have sufficient comprehension to understand that yes for those who might be watching this on the internet can you bring out uh, a, a point the necessity for everybody those two groups that you're referring to to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit it's crucial to receive the voice of the Holy Spirit to know how to become an overcomer which of course will lead you into these situations well that has to be coupled with the understanding of the nature of the individual mm. a person that's born again comes into a totally new reality but he does not leave the old reality even though the potential for the old reality to be neutralized is there but at this point the only way he can benefit from the second application is through the will which is not taught people think because they're born again they automatically going to flow into a situation where it's going to come to them no the scripture tells us in no uncertain terms but it's not taught that you have to fight you have to have an aggressive desire to grow in the things of God the things of the spirit why because the old nature does not go away voluntarily right. it is designed to be in essence an opponent to stand in opposition to um, the will of consistently want to assert its influence it has to be put down mm -hmm. uh Thank literally you. killed to a point where its influence diminishes 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 to a point in which it is no longer receptive <coughs> uh, uh, the it loses its ability to influence the life mm -hmm. it's it's not in, in any way encouraged by organized religion <clears throat> people are made to think that they just suddenly flow into a life in Christ and uh, all the gravy is there for them to receive mr. Smith I believe okay and we, we just had this in the lesson yesterday there is a still small voice that will come and 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 give hints pay attention to this do thusly, do, you know, question what your what your motive is, and so on. So, so it, it's a spiritual thing, but the still small voice is the one that prompts us, every one of us, to do the right thing and to evaluate what we're doing and test the spirits. So, um, yes, is, is that contrary to what we're teaching right now, or is that no, you know, no, that's in flu in, in 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 harmony with what we're teaching. But the problem with that is. A person that's yielded to the carnal nature is going to walk right over the still small voice you have to have a desire to will to listen to the still small voice because the still small voice is not going to assert itself what's going to assert itself is the yelling and the screaming of the carnal voice because that's its nature God is a gentleman He's not going to force his will on anybody. He's just going to let it be known and make that let that person make their decision. That's the problem. <clears throat> That's why people reach a stage where they are open to uh, basically make a rationale for the most egregious opposition to God because the voice of the flesh is yelling in opposition to the still small voice of wisdom and the most egregious of that is that yelling voice telling the person that they're still serving God yes when they're doing the opposite 
Yes. It takes an act, act of the will to put that yelling voice down. Mm. But let's go on. <clears throat> so we see the two basic forms of rulership here. Now, Scripture teaches those who are born in the millennial period will qualify for life on the new earth, not the heavens. The new earth in the eternal state by one particular decision. Not a life of commitment, but there's going to be one test for these people that will determine their eternal destiny. And that has to do with <coughs> being faithful to God when Satan and the fallen host are released to deceive them. Revelation 20, verse 7 to 8. I wish we had more time because there's so much that we can't cover that I would like to give to us. Revelation 20, verse 7 to 8. And when the thousand years are expired, mm -hmm. so the end of millennium, you've had a thousand years of peace, love, joy, prosperity, the human race is in a paradise. It has need of nothing. It has flourished in its apex of the way God has designed the creation to grow and exist for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, comes the test. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive. This is the purpose for his release. To deceive the nations. This is the test of the human race. They're going to experience for the first time deception. Just like in the Garden of Eden, they were exposed to a test. Will you remain faithful to God after what you've heard? Or will you take the left hand path because you believe you've been brought into a point of believing in opposition to what you have been told? The same thing, same test. Same guy, Satan. <clears throat> will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is, is the sand of the sea. You have billions of people on the earth today. I believe at this time you're going to have trillions. Mm. Why? Because the billion, 8 billion people on the earth today, you could fit them into the state of Texas and everybody would have living space. The reason you have problems now is because the stupid mercantile system does not make available the lush, plush riches right. of the earth to its inhabitants. Right. At this time, everybody is going to be in a position to receive the fullness of what the earth has to offer. Praise the Lord. So I believe you're going to have trillions of people living on the earth at the time of this period of deception. Verse 9, And they went up on the breath of the earth and come past the camp of the saints. Notice what it says. They have been gathered together to battle. Gathered together to battle. They have been incited to overthrow the authority of the new earth's rulers. Notice what they do. They surround. They encompass the camp of the saints. What is the camp of the saints? It's the place in which the immortals rule the earth. The earth is going to comprise of two people, mortals and immortals. The lifestyle, the limitations of the mortals are not going to be the lifestyle and the unlimited composition of the immortals, the saints. So the saints are going to be in a place qualifying or a preserve for immortals 
Jerusalem, the city, is going to be the city for mortals, for the human race. The rulers of the human race are in a different a different reality, if you will, right. because they're immortal. Right. So both regions are surrounded now by these that are in rebellion. <clears throat> so it says, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now we want to see the extent of this because people just picture the city being wiped out and uh, maybe being consumed. That's not what's, what the scripture tells us. Scripture teaches after surrounding Jerusalem, the whole creation, the whole creation, the heavens and the earth, the whole secondary creation will suddenly be destroyed. Its reality will cease to exist. Turn to 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 10. Then we're going to come back to Revelation. 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 10. We read, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So it's going to come suddenly. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It will literally consume the very essence of the reality. In other words, this whole thing will cease to exist. Now, turn back to Revelation 20, verse 9. We're going to start with verse 9 and then we're going to read now. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven. Now you notice what it's saying here. <clears throat> comes out from not the lower heavens. It comes down from the primary creation heavens, consumes the lower heavens, consumes the whole uh, um, physical secondary, secondary creation. creation. Takes it out of existence. The elements that make this a reality cease to exist. So at that point, all there is is the new earth, the new heavens. Anything else? Well, there's nothing. Because at this point, the new heavens and the new earth are in a different reality. Right. I'm talking about all that's left are those spiritual or physical, excuse me, um, spiritual realities, meaning the new earth and the new heavens. In essence, There is yes. no physical no. entity left at, at nothing all. Nothing physical. Remains, yes. So the inhabitants of the region of that, of that heaven get translated to the new earth? No. They're burned up? They die. Yeah. Uh, their spiritual essence remains, and everybody, everybody, human and non-human, is going to appear before the throne of God. But just before you get to that point, yeah. answering his question, You've got these humans in physical form standing on... They're the not physical. Before they get to the point that you're talking about. Ten minutes before what you've just said. Mm -hmm. The physical earth still exists. Yeah. These people are in physical form. Yes. They're about to get wiped out. Yes. Okay. At the point that they get wiped out, mm -hmm. they're in trauma, they're in pain, they're in whatever it would be. It would be as if a fireball had been you know, thrown on their heads. Right. Well, it is a fireball has been thrown on their heads. Okay. Not only the humans, everything in intelligence, the, the, the essence of the nations, they have a body that's not as corruptible and, and on a lower level as ours, 
but they go out as well. They're out of form, wipes out. Everything physical is burnt up. Right. So who flesh disappears? So that's why I asked, where do, where do the, the remaining go to? Where do they get translated to? Where they are, before the throne. Nobody moves anywhere. You can't, because there's no place to move. Wherever you are, if you're in the heavens, you're wiped out. You're in the earth, you're wiped out. Now, understand, there's no longer a physical in which you right. can say you went from this place to that, to place. that place. It doesn't exist anymore. So the physical reality happens. disappears, leaving the spiritual reality is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Now, we want to take a look at this reality that they're going to find themselves in. Turn to Revelation, the sixth chapter, verse 16. At a time during the tribulation period, what you see here, the, 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 the lower uh, space-time continuum, if you want to call it that, is wiped out. What happens when it's wiped out? Verse 16, people look up, what do they see? Said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What they see, they see the heavens, they see the heavens spread out, all of them. But what's overshadowed is the throne of God. That's what terrifies them. They say, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. Now turn to Revelation 20. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. It's the same throne that you read about in Revelation 6. Six. Okay. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. The only difference between this and Revelation 6 is that when he takes apart the space-time continuum, you see the lower heavens. But at this point, the lower heavens as well as the earth is burned up. There's nothing there but the throne. So the inhabitants of the earth, the inhabitants of the heavens are in the same place that they were. Right. But their physical is burned up. Nothing physical exists. Everybody now is overshadowed by the throne. Now when this first happened, these guys are terrified. Revelation 6, they're trying to get away because of the terror that they feel when they're watching the, the Father on the throne. Sure. Well now there's no place to flee. Mm. Everybody and it's, the, 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 the reality is ex exalted to the, to the nth degree now. Are you saying there's no place to to flee because the physical reality no longer exists. Exactly. Because they're in tune with the physical reality is what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. They right. have no sense of direction. So the moment they understand that there's no more physical reality, they're in a spiritual reality, it's at that point they recognize the Father can see all things. Well, they recognized that before. Then why but are they now the reality is this is this is all the reality they have. Okay. You can't you can't substitute right. anything right. before they could go to the rocks sure. or they could do this or they could try to blank it out. Sure. You can't do that. Now, you got no body. Mm. You're just in essence in front of the almighty creator for the first time. Right. You can't dance around what you've been trying to make excuses for. It's going to stare you in the face. That raises a question. Yes. At that point, standing in front of the Father in a pure spiritual reality, mm -hmm. is it possible for a person to even attempt to make up excuses? It, no. Even if they try, this no. is not possible. No, right. no, no, no. <laughs> that, that... No, that's I'm, not not saying, a, I'm not saying the Father you know, might be swayed by it. No, course, no, that's but not an option. it's not even possible, right? No. They because, didn't even want to do that in Revelation 6. They just want to get away. Right, right. So what do you think they're thinking about now? I Their bodies have so. been wiped out. Right. Their bodies wiped out. Life is gone. Right. And they're standing there naked 
in front of you, you're dealing with for the first time truth. Absolute, undeniable truth. Wow. Whether human or non human. Mm. Everybody is scared to, to death. death. Yeah. They're terrifying. But let's go on. When this happens, the first guy to get it is Satan. Verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So you find everybody, human and non-human, are standing before the throne where they originally were. Mm -hmm. but, but where they originally were was on an earth or in a heaven. No earth and no heaven. Now you're just there, you and God. Wow. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, I want to give you something. We probably won't have time to finish this. But I want to try to explain something. People get a, an impression that everybody that ever lived is going to be standing at the great white throne judgment. And it's not the case. You mean all at the same time? <clears throat> yes. Okay. There will be most won't stand there at all. Because? You're not going to have any born again saints standing there. Okay. Because all the born again saints that qualified for heaven received everything they needed at the second coming, a thousand years prior to this. Right. Yes. Because there is no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay. Exactly. So all those who are going to repent have repented and have received their positions. That's it. Okay. Yes. So what you're going to have here are basically those of the millennial period who are going to be judged from the things they did their works <clears throat> because they have no they didn't pass the test mm. they were not faithful so the father is going to show them that they have no leg to stand on your works good works you, you lived a whole thousand years doing good works didn't avail you when standing when 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 uh, uh, compared to the righteous prerog prerogative of of what God considers to be good works. They're going to show that the books open up, their sure. works can be seen. This is what you did, this is what you said, but this is God's status, this is God's priority of what he considers to be good. No way, yes. Is it a matter of doing versus being? Uh, it's a matter of being, but to the human mind, it's a matter of doing. That's why the cults flourish. Do this, do that, even under the old covenant law. It's a, it was a law, covenant of works. Do this, you'll be in good graces with God. Yeah. Well, the Father never authorized that. The Father says it's not doing, it's being. You're either in my Son or you're not. Mm -hmm. You're in my Son, then everything you do is acceptable to me. Outside of my Son, nothing you do is acceptable to me. That's the difference between Elohim and YHVH. YHVH gives this law through Moses, keep this covenant, keep this law, keep this ritual, keep this statue. You sin, you go and you take this sacrifice, you slit his throat, sprinkle the blood on the altar, you're covered, you're good. You're going to get these blessings. So the people come to believe that's all they need. And at the time of Jesus, it was so ingrained in them that the scribes and the Pharisees thought by keeping the law, they didn't need Jesus. They were good because this is what the scripture told them. Jesus tells them, search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But if you search the scriptures, you'll find I'm in there. You need me for eternal life. If you don't believe I am, you're going to die in your sins. I don't care what YGH taught you. This is what I'm teaching you. Simple as that. They're going to stand now before the throne and realize they got nothing. What they thought they had is nothing in comparison to what the demands of the Father is. 
and before they get thrown into the lake of fire they are going to protest not one whit because they're not going to have a leg to stand on after God shows them what his prerogative is all they can say is oh please don't do it you're done <laughs>